Our next speaker is Carolyn Aho Franklin. She's a staff scientist, molecular foundry, molecular biophysics, and integrated bioimaging division of Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Please welcome Caroline. Good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, it's actually a great privilege to be here um, at Rice University, and, and I really have to thank the organizing committee for not only putting this very interesting uh, uh, discussion together, but actually for the incredible hospitality that they've shown um, over the course of the meeting. So um, I want to talk today about how uh, we are using synthetic biology to create electronically uh, controlled microorganisms. Um, and I want to kind of harken back first to um, how, why we're doing this. And I worked with, I had the great privilege of working with Pam Silver as a postdoc um, uh, when she was starting up the synthetic biology effort in her lab. And I think, as you'll see from this picture, Pam really inspired me and many others to really follow in her wake and, and to think about how synthetic biology could really tackle the challenges of the 21st century. And so I think one of the biggest challenges in the 21st century is the realization that we are changing the planet on an unprecedented scale. We, we, we kind of have actually, geologists have actually named this new era the Anthropocene, reflecting the incredible changes that, the human, that humans are having on the surface of the planet, the chemistry of the planet, the microbial diversity, and, and indeed diversity of life on the planet. So when I talk to colleagues in the plant and microbial biology community, one of the things they'll emphasize to me is that we actually are on the verge of potentially the sixth mass extinction event um, across the world. If, it, if we look at the rate at which we are losing uh, organisms, species, um, it's 10 to 100 times faster than the kind of normal rate. And it basically is rivaling the rate at, of disappearance when we had the, uh, basically that big asteroid land <laughs> on the surface of the planet and basically destroy the dinosaurs and allow mammals to, to flourish. So this is a huge, um, huge, I think, rallying cry for, I think, scientists across many disciplines, but including um, synthetic biologists, to think about how we can really address um, global scale challenges uh, um, using synthetic biology. So, <clears throat> I'm going to dive down and talk about one very specific problem. So by 2050, we think there are going to be, as Pam said, 10 billion people on the planet. And if we look at what they need, we are going to need not only new energy, so 50% more energy, 100% more energy, we're going to need more food. Um, we're also going to need new materials. So we estimate that we're going to need somewhere between 100 uh, to time or 100% more materials than we currently have. Yet, because of climate change and because um, we have already extracted many of the very e uh, cheap to extract ores and, uh, from the face of the planet, we are going to need to do that to create these materials with less energy, with less water, and with fewer, with basically more dilute precursors. So that is kind of a, a serious scientific challenge. And what I would say to you is that I actually am inspired to kind of turn to biology as one of the potential solutions for this problem. So biological systems are really amazing in their ability to make materials um, that, ha that have many of the key features we're looking at for. So these materials, so skeleton, uh, bones, teeth, eggshells, the spicules of a sea urchin. These are materials that are grown under ambient conditions, oftentimes with very low energy inputs. Um, they are uh, made, they have multifunctionality. So they serve many 
different process, uh, uh, processes at once. So the eggshell not only is a protection and mechanical um, uh, physical structure, it is also a structure that has very selective, acts as a very selective filter that only allows uh, certain gases in and out. And that's what allows um, eggs to, to give life uh, to new organisms. So we, in addition, so we think we, looking at nature, we can see that there's a huge opportunity for making materials in a sustainable uh, way that could, could really affect the, the challenges we face. So that's what one of the real things that I think inspires me um, in this area is the question of can we go from, can we create a new era of materials and a new era in which we make materials. So we think we all know about how the invention of the silicon microchip changed how we live. Um, it has given rise to the digital information age. Um, what if we could make a new brand of materials using biology that would be the next revolution and that would pave a path to a more sustainable future? So right now we think of natu the natural world as containing things like us, organisms that grow and divide and self-heal. and self -heal. Um, And these systems have these amazing features, but I would say by and large, they're not yet engineerable in, a, in, a, in the way that certainly um, CMOS technology is engineerable. Or we have devices. Um, so think of your cell phone, think of your computer. These are highly engineered. Um, we can engineer them to our specifications. They're amazing in terms of the ability to do rapid data processing, uh, rapid communication, massive data storage. But if I throw any one of your phones uh, on the ground and stomp on it, uh, that's not going to fix itself in a couple days, um, no matter how many Band-Aids I put on it. <laughs> so could we really move uh, to a future in which we grow devices, in which there is a seamless communication and feedback between biology and materials. And if we could do that, we could maybe make a whole host of new technologies. And Pam talked about some of them. For example, the ability to make, take uh, essentially solar cells that self repair and create, um, in a very distributed way, chemicals. <clears throat> So this is what really propels us forward in the scientific vision that we, we see. So what, what, that's a huge challenge. What, let me tell you about a couple things that my group is doing to kind of address that huge technical challenge. So one of the things we're doing is we're very interested in understanding at the molecular level how living biomolecules can interface with inorganic materials. <laughs> There are precedents for this happening in nature, and we really want to understand how we can steal from nature to make new devices. We are also keenly interested in how you can actually use synthetic biology to allow living systems to seamlessly communicate and power uh, devices. We want to make those devices, and this is really much like we've heard from sort of the neurobiology um, brain um, interface, this is also a key question of how do you do this integration in a way that makes sense? And the last piece is how we uh, actually use biology to hierarchically assemble materials. So today what I'm going to go ahead and focus on is actually these two pieces of how do we en use synthetic biology to move energy and information, and how do we integrate this into devices? So one of the key challenges that, that really brought me into this field um, was the fact that we're really interesting, interested in electrically connecting living cells with inorganic materials and devices. Um, and that's actually something that, back to the idea of Frankenstein, people have been fascinated with for, for decades. Um, and so they've developed kind of two basic approaches to, for doing that, which is first you can use small molecules or you can use nanomaterials to actually sit 
in the cell membrane. And just to remind you, the cell membrane is fundamentally the physical barrier that separates life, which is on the inside, from death, which is on the outside. So this barrier, its physical integrity, is literally that line be between life and death. So <clears throat> if we out physically abrogate it, uh, we can get current in and out of cells. However, one of the things we can't do is really, because these structures don't have molecular specificity, we really can't control what we're turning on and off. It's, it's kind of the moral analogy of sticking your finger in an electric socket. Yes, you move current, but it's not a particularly um, well-controlled uh, system. So, um, for example, you can turn on, by doing this, you can turn on gene regulation or energy production, um, at, but these are very different functions. So what my group really wanted to address is, could we use synthetic biology to actually build back in molecular recognition and actually enable um, this flow of electrons in a bidirectional way, but now with uh, all the power of, of molecular biology. So what we actually used um, uh, as kind of the blueprint was actually uh, bacteria that Jeff Grelnick right over there is kind of one of the major pioneers in, um, which is this bacteria Shewanella odonysis MR1, or Shiwi to its friends. Um, and this is a class of metal-reducing bacteria, actually, which Derek here uh, has actually Pioneer, been pioneering and discovering as well. And the key, key thing that these microorganisms do is they exist in environments where there's not abundant oxygen. So they have figured out to basically use, uh, be able to do redox chemistry with extracellular minerals instead of oxygen. So they've learned to breathe minerals instead of oxygen as a way of creating energy. And the way they, they do this is they kind of just to kind of make a long story short, they, they take sugar, they oxidize it, and then they move the electrons through this pathway, which is a set of proteins that basically sit most critically in the outer membrane and move electrons to uh, either, in, either a, an iron oxide that they can find in their environment, or actually, incredibly, they could also move it to an electrode. And so what we wanted to do when we started in this area is basically to ask the question, is that blueprint I showed you on the last slide, is that enough to basically electrify organisms? Can we put that in new organisms and give them the ability to make current? And the quick answer is yes. Um, so we actually took those genes that I showed you on the previous slide, put them in um, essentially the hydrogen atom of bacteria, uh, E. coli, and basically showed that um, when you put those uh, genes in, you could get bacteria to not only, our E. coli to not only reduce iron, but actually to make current. And so thus, electronic, or E. coli, was born. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of technical details in how you make this work. Um, it, as you can kind of see, it wasn't quite so easy. But I want to kind of focus on what we can do with it now that we've built it. Um, and I want to address kind of two questions. Can we use this to control reactions inside of the cell? And can we make this a bidirectional system? So I just want to remind you um, that electron transfer uh, in microorganisms and in you is kind of one of the key ways that living systems uh, regulate a variety of behaviors. So what's going on when you breathe oxygen right now is you oxidize a sugar and you send it through this amazing electron transfer pathway where you take oxygen and make water. And in the process, you're pumping protons across the membrane of your mitochondria. And this does a couple things. First of all, it maintains redox balance in the cell. Second thing it does is actually um, by making a chemoosmotic gradient, it allows you to actually conserve energy and make ATP. This is the, the, basically the energy currency for all cells. Um, but also critically, it has an amazing impact on biosynthesis. So when this electron transfer pathway is operational, you take sugar and you make CO2 and water, also known as sparkling water. 
But when it's not operational, we make beer. And um, that, those are two very different substances, as we can uh, explore many times over. <laughs> So what we really wanted to ask the question is, if we could really control electron transfer in an organism, can we control things like biosynthesis <coughs> and growth of these organisms? Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm showing you over here is actually kind of the Frankenstein uh, uh, equivalent for um, bacteria, where we're putting bacteria in with an electrode and actually running current um, out or into them. Um, but what I want to really show you is that when we take these engineered E. coli um, and give them a sugar source, they can make current over the course of many days. If we lead about sugar, which is essentially where all the electrons are coming from, we don't get sustained current. And if we don't have this pathway, we lose all of our current as well. Um, we have actually then gone ahead and measured how that current production affects the metabolism of the cell. And it actually makes, uh, it's kind of what we expected. So when you feed E. coli lactate, it really doesn't know what to do with it um, very much. It makes formate and ethanol. But when you introduce this pathway, what the cell does is it realizes that it has now a way to regenerate NADH, um, which is, or excuse me, NAD, which is basically to maintain redox balance within the cell. And so you actually see form, uh, reduction in, uh, in the amount of formate and ethanol you make, and instead you make acetate. And what this really means is that the cell, that by introducing this pathway, we are able to electronically control the reactions that are going on in the cell in a well-defined way. We can essentially use the electrode as a way of sucking out electrons at will. So that's um, one kind of path for this movement of electrons out of the cell. But we also are very much interested in pushing electrons in. And this is largely um, for one of the reasons that Pam alluded to. If you could take CO2 and, and electricity and make fuels, well, that would be a pretty huge game changer in terms of how we can affect the, the planet. So, um, what, again, uh, actually Jeff uh, Grelnick and Daniel Bond showed is that when, if you can actually change the bias of, of the electrode, you can actually push electrons into the cell um, in, in Shiwi. So we wanted to ask the question, can you do this now in an engineered E. coli? And the quick answer is yes. If we add a, a basically a sink for electrons inside the cell, we see a, substantial negative current. That means current entering into the cell. Um, and we can do this uh, with a variety of electron acceptors. So um, we can also do the gnarly biochemistry and show that we pre know precisely where these electrons are flowing through. Um, so that's a critical part of this, is really being able to, to move these things with precision. And then uh, I guess what I want to kind of tell you is that this has, has told us that basically there are two different ways that we can move electrons in and out of organisms. So if we make the electrode very negatively biased, we can actually pull electrons in uh, through this sort of pathway. But if we make the electrode very positively biased, we can actually pull electrons out. So this kind of gives us two very distinct levers of controlling a cell, of pulling electrons in, or pu pulling electrons in, or pushing them out. So I think this really starts to look like a bidirectional wire, but with molecular specificity. Um, so then uh, what, where I kind of want to go with this is, so this is one particular system from one particular uh, organism. But we're now thinking about, well, what else is out there? What other synthetic biology building blocks are out there? And um, one of the things that we've discovered uh, in collaboration with um, uh, Dan Portnoy's group at UC Berkeley is that there's actually a lot more of these organisms that we thought, uh, and they reside in the gut. So in particular, what what we've been working on over many years is gram-negative bacteria. And the thing you really need to know about them is they basically have a double wall um, membrane 
so that they're, they're uh, double insulated against the environment. In contrast, gram-positive organisms have this thick wall of a sugar um, surrounding you know, only a single membrane. So that really has profound implications from a physiological point of view of how you get electrons in and out. And many, um, what, what we did, Oh, okay, let's see. Sorry, this slide. Okay. Ah, it's just very slow. Sorry. So what we did is basically um, with uh, Dan Portnoy's group is discovered that um, fortuitously that actually a gut pathogen, Listeria monocytogenes, is able to actually reduce extracellular minerals. And why that, I'm sorry, slides are really misbehaving. Why that is, um, is actually a matter of, of debate. But I guess the key thing I want to uh, convey to you is that we have actually discovered now that this extracellular electron transfer that was largely thought to exist only in microorganisms that live in the soil are now actually abundant in organisms that live in your gut. And so we're trying to now understand why that is and what we can do with it. Okay. And if my slides will agree with me, I can just show you that basically these, this electron transfer pathway um, involve, is in a variety of pathogens in the gut, but also a variety of organisms of great uh, industrial interest, uh, particularly in the dairy um, uh, industry. So we think this offers a new set of opportunities for synthetic biology and coupling bioelectronics into things like the microbiome, food, and agriculture. So <clears throat> with the last sort of section of my talk, I want to talk about the other side of this problem. So I've talked mainly about how we can discover and engineer biology to look, work at this interface. That's that's one hand clapping. So you really need the other hand. You need uh, the uh, materials engineering to really match that. And so that's what we've been doing with a variety of colleagues at, at LBL. And because we're not Harvard, potentially, <laughs> um, it's actually incredibly easy co to collaborate. And it has been a great joy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so uh, national, labs. Again, national labs are all about big big in team science. So the, actually, one of the things that we, we uh, have been working on is exactly the problem that Pam mentioned of scalability. So one of my close colleagues um, uh, just across the building works in artificial photosynthesis. And what he, he pointed out to me is these devices that I showed you on the other slide, um, and ones like ones that, that Pam showed, you know, one of the big challenges that for scalability is you've got these two compartments that you s put the, two, the bio on one side and the material on the other side because you're worried that the material is going to kill the bio or the bio is going to follow your material. Okay, so you put them far apart. It's like children fighting. You put them far apart and you hope it's okay. But the problem with that is that actually in these systems, there's a silent partner. These ion, you actually have to have ions move um, in the same direction as you're moving electrons. And when you separate these two uh, compartments, you actually end up with a huge resistive loss that really threatens uh, sort of the energy efficiency of these systems. So what Heinz Frey and I, uh, what Heinz suggested is said, hey, look, you know, I've been working in this area of artificial photosynthesis. I have developed these amazing silica. He didn't say this, but it's true. Uh, amazing silica membranes, which are two nanometers thick. They allow protons to move, but no gases, no chemicals. And they also have these embedded molecular wires that move electrons. So this has enabled him to couple inorganic catalysts with small molecule catalysts, which suffer this same problem of in chemical incompatibility. So we wanted to ask the question, well, gee, so this works with a small molecule catalyst. 
an inorganic organic catalyst where you can couple them protonically and electronically over two nanometers, but chemically separate them. What if you replace a small molecule catalyst with a, with a bacteria? Would that work? So yeah, it does. Um, so what we first did is actually have to sit and think about the energetics of this, and we had to redesign um, one of these embedded wires uh, to be able to um, match the energetics with the bacteria. Um, but Heinz is amazing in this, and he just whipped it up real fast. Um, and then we actually took this device and asked the question, can we, you, can we actually send electrons through this molecular wire from the bacteria to the inorganic catalyst? And what, you can, what I'm showing you is current as a function of time in systems where we have the inorganic catalyst on one side and the bio uh, catalyst on the other. If there's no wires in that one two nanometer membrane, then basically you, you don't got any current. But when you've got those little molecular wires, wires, you get about a 50-fold increase. And what I should also tell you is that amount of current production is enough to allow the cells to survive and grow on the surface. So this begins to start to be a nanotech materials approach to actually building, taking the systems like Pam was talking about and scaling them up. Um, because now you can do, the, you can basically get the tremendous surface area and, and, and eliminate the ohmic losses that were really uh, crippling before. So the last kind of um, piece that I want to talk about is the environment. So I think, again, bioelectronics for the environment is another big piece. So one of the things that as, agri as climate is changing, as agriculture is changing, is the question of how can we actually understand what's going on and basically use precision medicine for plants and agriculture. Right now, farmers kind of look at the weather and they say, well, I think I need to fertilize here and you know, maybe I should set, throw some plant protecting uh, bacteria over here. But it is not in any way a precision precision sort of approach. So one of the pieces that's missing is an understanding of what the different environment across kilometers of fields are and what's happening at sort of the centimeter uh, level with the plant microbe interactions. And so in to order under, to understand these things, you also really need to be able to sense not just pH or, or um, dissolved oxygen, you need to understand the, the molecules, you need to be able to sense the molecules that the organisms are using to talk to each other. So what, what we um, are doing, um, and this is actually also a nascent collaboration with, with Joff Silberg in the audience, is basically figuring out how we can take the fact that these bacteria make electricity and convert those into very fast sensors. And the, the basic idea is that if you've got a sugar and, it's, um, um, and it is able to do electron transfer, you've got high current. But if you can interrupt at any level of the pathway, uh, basically make one of those uh, literally a switch, then you can actually make fast sensors. And what's nice about this is that Joff is a, a Joff and others have already figured out how to make um, molecules inside the cell that basically do electron transfer based on uh, the presence of a small molecule. So that's not quite ready for prime time, but I'll talk about how we're now building devices to actually approach this in the longer term. So <clears throat> what we have done with Michelle Marhabitz, who actually uh, was mentioned yesterday as kind of a neural dust aficionado, um, is basically figure out how to take potentia stats that are usually yay big and turn them into things that are the size of a penny and uh, uh, integrate those with Wi-Fi. So if we take that, and then we also figure out how to miniaturize those big reactors that I showed you that are typically on the order of 200 milliliters, um, and put them, basically miniaturize them using a combination of material science uh, um, uh, approaches as well as sort of 3D printing approaches, we can miniaturize those reactors to the size of a penny. And when you put these two things together, you can basically make uh, bioelectronic 
sensing system, which I affectionately call BESIs. Um, and what they are are basically these sensors, it's bacterial sensors embedded in these small reactors, which are electrically connected to uh, this Wi-Fi that can basically report out on what's, what's going on chemically in the environment. Okay, so just kind of to dive into the guts of this, one of the things we discovered in our first version of this is that when we basically uh, were trying to build this reactor, we were getting very sparse coverage of the bacteria on the carbon felt. They basically weren't uh, dense uh, networking. And what that meant is that in terms of making a device, we had a much bulk bulkier device than we think, think we really needed. So in collaboration um, with uh, uh, Daniel Simon and uh, Magnus Bergen at um, uh, uh, University of Lund, we found that we could actually take, instead of uh, just putting our bacteria on carbon fiber, we could actually use an organic electronic. We could use P.PSS to actually artificially build a biofilm um, that would ha have much higher electrical connectivity and give us much uh, uh, denser coverage of bacteria. And you can see that in confocal images where these blue things are the cells and the red are the carbon fibers. But you can also see this by SEM where you can actually see in, the, uh, in our devices basically a thick layer of this organic electronic where our bacteria are now enmeshed, embedded in this. So we've basically figured out how to uh, make um, artificial bacterial biofilms. And one of the key things we can do it, by doing a couple clever tricks with how we're reading out the sensors, we can basically differentiate um, in these whole, bio, whole cell biosensors uh, changes in temperature between um, which we're not interested in and changes in specific chemicals that we are. So by uh, doing some clever synthetic biology, we can isolate only the changes in the chemistry that we want. So with that, I'm, I know I'm going long. I want to just kind of give you this idea that you know, synthetic biology, I think, has a lot to offer in terms of energy, environment, and sustainability. Um, and we think that bioelectronics is actually a piece of this because it allows us to move electrons, electricity, in and out of cells. It gives us a way to control what the cells are doing and understand what they're hearing from their environment. And that a key part of actually taking these devices, scaling them up, and making them really deployable is a very molecular level understanding uh, of this interface and seamlessly integrating it. So with that, I will thank um, my group, um, our collaborators, which have made uh, this so much fun to do, um, funding because uh, it's kind of what makes, uh, makes us all of this possible. And to thank you all for your attention. We have time for a question. Raphael. So um, I think you showed really nicely how building in these electron conduits allows you to get to devices. And you can start imagining you know, a variety of different uh, devices you could build and engineer the bacteria to, to have some response. Um, you also mentioned earlier in your talk that mediators, these small molecule mediators, can be used to effectively so transfer electrons. Sure. Yep. And I'm wondering, and, and, that, and if you do that, you don't have to engineer the electron conduit. So I'm wondering, in, in, from a device perspective, um, you know, is that a simpler route? Can you do the same things using mediators that are then just oxidized or reduced at the electrode, diffused to the bacteria, yep. perf you know, activate some pathway? You know, it, so so I'm, I'm wondering of the relative advantages of these two strategies for electron transfer. Uh, so I would not hesitate to say that mediators are a simpler way. However, they are an incredibly imprecise way. So there's some very nice evidence showing that when you introduce mediators, Basically, you're radically altering the redox state of the cells in a very, for lack of a better word, haphazard way. And so you start turning on transcriptional programs, stress responses. You get major changes in what the cell is making. 
but not a lot of it that makes a whole lot of sense. And so you're, you have simplicity, no control. I actually feel like we're, we're at a place where we're getting closer to simplicity, but we have a lot of control. And I like control. Thank you very much. Thank you.